Palingenesis by Simon Herewood. Book Two Darkening Tide. Chapter 5 Fingor Sun. So the new destination was Aaron. Rune regarded Karth with a wry little smile. You couldn't pick a destination for once, uh, where I might be at least slightly welcome. Karth returned the smile. You've made that near impossible. The smiles disappeared. Rune knitted his brows. Right. Karth continued nonchalantly. I need you there. Apart from the Aaronite King and Captains, you will meet with agents from Gilreth. What? Rune was genuinely astonished. Your plotting is quite masterful. If you had the Aaronites agree to that... Wait, they did agree to it, didn't they? Of course. Recent developments have opened the eyes of men in positions of power in Aaron. You will find their changed attitude amazingly refreshing. Shows what can be achieved if men would take off their blindfolds long enough. But I digress. You are needed in Aaron personally to report firsthand on what you saw in the South. Rune raised his hands in protest. No, no, there is no chance of that. They will never believe such a fantastic tale. I did. If you but tell it the same way. You are... Rune searched for a word that would not give offense. Different. Not so different anymore. And you have to admit, there is little danger involved this time, unless you count the danger of not being believed. He appeared thoughtful for a moment. There may be trouble from Malik's agents, though. I will send bodyguards with you, and instruct my men in Aaron. Attempts have been made recently, even as far south as Kiel. Attempts? Assassination. Rune smiled. Now that I can handle. Garth did not reply immediately. He would not inform the arrogant Viran in front of him that he would not be the target. There is another thing. I have a replacement for Milan. He is needed here for the time being. That came as no surprise to Rune. The young man's encounter in the Dankwood had all but shattered his nerves. He would be kept in fur for a while to recuperate. I'll uh, send him to you this afternoon. Where will you be? Released from the training of Karth's cohorts at last. Rune had taken to walking about the countryside from first light till sunset. He would not have admitted it, but the island and its isolation had a way of calming the restless spirit and bringing perspective to overextended thinking. Tomorrow he sailed for Aaron, and probably more senseless danger. Today he would sit by the running brook and let his thoughts wander. I'll be at the crossing in the gorge. Hanik knows the place. Garth nodded. So do I. The unhurried rush of water so close by him, the semi-dark cavern of trees, the smooth river stone seat, these had almost become familiar friends to Rune, sharing his confidences and innermost thoughts. For a man with so many dark contemplations, it was an essential refuge, a place to regain one's perspective, always so tantalizingly out of reach in the town. Where do you go from here, Rune Seth Elberad? When you have slain your brother, and even the score, what will you do then? Ah, the pathetic musings of a man old before his time. What would he do? He would laugh, long and loud, savoring the moment of sweet revenge, like the slaking of one's thirst with a satisfying drink. Then he would pick off a couple of others, including that old vulture Talon, Billy felt no more need for the spilling of blood. A light footfall approached down the rocky pathway leading into the deep shade of the wooded gorge. A small figure stepped out of the weak rhyme song sun and bounded light-footed onto a boulder next to him. Rune recognized him at once, as if he could forget his startling moment in the courtyard. Ah, it's you. The boy with the theorist gaze looked at him a little shyly. Yes, I have to go with you to Aaron. He studied the child with suspicion. What game was Karth playing now? 
Certainly, there would be danger in Aaron, and a young boy could easily compromise his position. Well, don't pack your gear as yet. Uh, what is your name again? There was the slightest hesitation. Gareth. Rune raised his brows. Just Gareth? The boy set his jaw and looked him firmly in the eye. Gareth Sith Lur. Rune smiled disbelievingly, but did not dispute the point. And where are you from, Gareth Sith Lur? The child did not blink. Nowhere in particular. Was there the flicker of a smile around his lips? But most recently from Heron Inrath. Where have I heard that before? Rune furrowed his brow in concentration. The fleeting image of an open boat, the grinning faces of his rescuers congealed into the smiling visage of Hanik. An odd look passed between him and the boy. You have been here long? Rune asked. Some seasons. You don't belong to any of the Biran men here. No, of course not, he said. Why was he so nervous all of a sudden? Why didn't the boy stop looking at him like that? As if he had read the man's mind, Gareth glanced away at the water, the mossy stones, and ancient trees. It's lovely here. You can think clearly. And there's never any snow to stop the flow. You are from the Northland, then. Gareth was beginning to realize how futile it was to try to escape the past. It always caught up with you in the end. In this case, he was desperate for it not to. I spent some time in Erin. Ah, is that where you picked up the language? Gareth smiled at the memory. You could say that. They walked back to Fur together, the boy falling silent ear long. The answers he offered Rune's probing questions, evasive and vague. In the end, Rune knew little more than half his name, his age, and the little he had learned by the brook. He decided to approach Karth about this puzzling development that evening. The old man was no more cooperative than the boy had been. Why replace Millen with this child? He is your translator. And your spy? Garth raised an eyebrow but did not reply. Rune regarded him appraisingly. It is not as though I could not speak the Aaronite language. The older man shrugged. There are more ways of communicating than mere speech. Trust cannot be captured in the words of a diplomat or ambassador. Your reception in Aaron may be very cold without his presence. Rune narrowed his eyes as he contemplated this latest wriggle. He changed his tack. There is something oddly familiar about this boy. He caught himself just in time from using the word disturbingly. Where did you say you found him? I did not. But he was quite a find, young as he is. You may discover yet that he has talents that are extremely useful. Another pawn in your politics? Garth nodded almost imperceptibly, the flicker of a sarcastic smile on his lips. You know me too well. Gareth saw the by now familiar form leaning against the side of a warehouse in the port of Angen. It was frost early still, with the last stars fading rapidly and a spreading golden light in the east. Keeping his hands thrust firmly into his surcoat, he hurried up the wooden walkway, his breath streaming about him. His black hood fell back, and the cold pinched his nose, ears, and cheeks till they were pink and burning. Rune watched him run up. He noticed a barely concealed eagerness, a young boy excited at the prospect of embarking on an adventure. He felt his lips curl into a smile, but a sudden pang checked him. He hated to see this fresh-faced child used by the likes of Karth for underhanded scheming. Rune turned to look away over the sea. The boy came to a halt right next to him, his shoulder unintentionally touching the man's elbow. He steamed out a good morning, and the smile returned to Rune's face. Just on time, comrade. Our ship awaits. He pointed to where a boat detached itself from the high, proud vessel that would take them to Aaron. Gareth stepped forward and gripped the railing in front of him with both hands. He glanced back at Rune with such open-mouthed excitement that the latter had to shake his head. What was Kart thinking? So, what are you good for, Gareth Sethmuller? 
the boy turned away from the boat. He brought up his hands and placed them over his ears in an effort to warm them. Tilting his head in a peculiar way, he said, That depends what you need. Tell me what's so exciting about going to Aaron. Gareth's face lit up. I have many good friends there. Friends? Yes. One of them saved my life three times. He's a captain. Every end of kill. He has his own boat, and he's the winner of the rock race this cycle. I... The rock race? They race with rocks in Aaron. No! <laughs> the boy laughed loudly. Silly! The boat race from Keel to Aaron Rock! Then he realized he was being teased. But you know that. <laughs> Rune laughed too, surprised at how easy it was. You spent your time in Aaron quite well, I see. You didn't have to hide in holes to avoid the angry mob, did you? It was a hesitation before Gareth answered. No, not for the most part, anyway. I even met the king. He broke off. Rune noticed and pounced. You are important, then. I was. He bit his lip and looked trapped. Rune let it go. He bent down to pick up his traveling bag. Gareth only realized how much he had missed the exhilaration of the ocean passage once they were well underway. The fresh westerly breeze had them speeding over low rolling swell, racing the high cotton clouds to the north. He was going to Aaron again. So much had happened since he had seen it last. He was free of fear now, free of pursuit, free of Fengor. A voice sounded behind him, rudely breaking in on his thoughts. You have been watching me. I saw you from the training yard. Rune spoke accusingly, as if he expected an explanation. The boy turned, a little startled. Everybody watches you. They admire your skill. You give them courage. And you? Do you admire my skill? Do I give you courage? The answer was just a whisper, but he saw the lips move. Yes. Laughter exploded from the man, a little forced. <laughs> what is it with all of you? So you think I'm the hero to hold back Garth's sworn? Gareth looked at him as if he was acting like a silly child. It is Malik sworn. And no, a single man cannot hold it back. But someone like you could destroy the beast in the Dankwood. Rune gaped in amazement. So, you know about that, eh? Well, I'm glad to have your vote of confidence. It is really all I need to inspire me to great deeds of valor. And since you have seen it for yourself, and thus have an expert opinion... He stopped abruptly. The boy's face had brightened at his last words. Then came the strange request. Will you show it to me? He had not heard correctly. What? Gareth took a step closer. He spoke eagerly. You just have to think of the monster, and what you saw. Then you let me in, and I can see it too. Rune recoiled as if he had been struck. Here was the treacherous touch of the old sorcerer. He was shouting, Stay out of my thoughts! The memory of an awkward moment in the training yard came back to him. You did that! Wizard's brat, this is Karth's doing! He turned to go, but thought to add, I will have no part in sorcery! Rune ducked back out of sight. Gareth stood astonished. He closed his mouth and lowered his hands. Karth had warned him. He had felt the resistance in the yard. But this display was simply incredible. Such a big, dangerous man could shout and run like a frightened girl at the sight of a rat. It was even a little funny. Rune purposely avoided him during the rest of the voyage. It was childish, of course, for a grown man to appear sulky and walk about frowning for no reason. The crew was glad to be rid of them by the evening of the third day. Karth's ship slipped into port as the sky darkened in the east. It had been planned this way, for Karth had instructed them not to let the passengers off in broad daylight. He wanted the risk of being seen and recognized to be minimal. Rune was more talkative now. The point about sorcery he had obviously been trying to make had been made. He still would not meet Gareth's eye, though, and seemed to concentrate excessively when they spoke. The boy thoroughly regretted making the controversial request by now, and had secretly purposed to avoid all references to the art while they traveled together. It would be difficult in the extreme, but Rune was certainly not ready for it yet. There was something else for which he was not ready. They were expected by the Aaronites, 
and Gareth tried to coax him across the causeway to the fortress of Aaron Rock. To the boy, it would be thrilling to be housed there for the night. Rune believed otherwise. No, I have no intention of spending the night in an Aaronite hall I can't easily get myself out of. We'll sleep in the town. Gareth could not help himself. The thought of not seeing Evrain straight away made him unreasonably angry. A fine hero you are, frightened of a good meal and a warm bed. Strangely enough, Rune did not take exception to this disrespectful retort. It is called prudence, boy, something you have much to learn about. Most often, it keeps you alive in places like this. The inn was good enough as far as inns went. The room was of reasonable size with a high ceiling, even if it stank a little of fish, and the beds were solid and well covered, if a little low to the ground. Rune insisted on supping in the common room instead of taking the evening meal in their quarters. He had stayed in the inn before while selling off merchandise in the port, and the landlord thought nothing of it. Gareth was uncomfortable though, and sat hunched over his food the entire time, as if he could somehow become invisible. He endured the hostile stares with ill grace, partly blaming Rune for this difficult situation. If he had been a little more cooperative, they would be sitting around a table with Evrain tonight. The boy frowned and put on a sullen face. Rune smiled sardonically. Met the king, eh? Have lots of friends in Aaron, eh? Why don't you go over and shake hands with that big sailor over there? He looks like he wants to be your friend. Gareth did not even look in his direction. He doesn't know me. He thinks I'm his enemy. Yes, and you can shake hands with him for the next ten days. It will make no difference. Rune was suddenly serious. To the pit with a whole lot of them. That scum decided you are his enemy simply because you look different to them. And I say if he wants an enemy, then let him have one. Gareth did not reply. He sat staring at his bowl. Rune was right, but he did not want him to be. You better ignore this lot or you will not be able to digest your food. I'm only a little hungry now. Rune laughed so loudly that several more heads turned his way. <laughs> the problem is, you still think of yourself as a Nurian, Viron. And these men must hate you because they hate all the Viron. I, on the other hand, am free of that rotten heritage. I am an islander. Whether from Track or the Witch Isle, it matters not. In fact, these men know very little about how one can really hate those Viron swine. The blue eyes had fixed on him now, the food, the crowd forgotten. You speak of your brother. I speak of the whole lot. Talon, Garrelain, Malvor, Byran, Fingor, and that lick speckled snide and arrogant brat of his. Lucain. The single word dropped between them like a stone. Gareth had such a look of disgust on his face that it gave the man pause. You know him? Who doesn't? You are from the north, then. You lived in Belruth. It was a simple statement of fact. Rune smiled inwardly. The poor little boy had no way of keeping his secrets to himself. Soon, he would know everything he wanted to about this latest ambiguity. Causeway connecting Aaron Town to the rock was wet and slippery still when they made their way onto it with the mid-morning traffic. Gareth trudged as close to the edge as he could, peering over the side now and then. Rune kept his eyes on his feet, walking in the rutted track the carts had made over countless cycles. He was apprehensive about his meeting with the King of Aaron. Would his unbelievable encounter be credible to these people? If Karth's diplomatic efforts here depended on the reception of his account, then the old man was more desperate than he had heretofore suspected. To tell the tale in the pale light of day, in front of obviously distrustful men, would be an ordeal in itself. 
he was not going to be called a liar. By the time they reached the gates of the Black Stone Fortress, he had decided that it did not matter in the end. He would do what was required and could not be held responsible for the results. They were expected. He was even addressed as Prince Rune, as if there was still value in such an appellation. It did improve his mood, though. It was comforting to know that these men had absolutely no regard for Fengor's wishes. It was an imposing stronghold. The walls were massive, founded on the solid rock of the islet. The main gate was defended by a heavy portcullis and flanking towers for enfilading archery. Machinery of war occupied every available space. The walls were crowded with bulging battlements, allowing defenders to rain down any manner of projectile on the assailants without risk of being shot. Uniformed guards marched up and down along the walkways and parapets with a business-like air. These men were trained and ready, as formidable in appearance as their fortress. Rune accorded them a grudging respect in passing. They were a far cry from the raw recruits he had attempted to beat into a fighting force on Heron Inrath. The meeting hall was of necessity not as spacious as its counterparts in the inland castles. Trestle tables had been set up for the different parties. The single table where he and the boy would sit was far off to the left, closer to the Aaronites than the Viron contingent. A cloth of sable, decorated with Karth's single silver arrow, had been draped over it. Grun shook his head at this extravagance. Aaronites. Only the Virhan delegation from Gilreth was seated already. They huddled in a frowning, suspicious group, making Rune wonder why they had bothered to attend. One did not travel so far, at risk of being called a traitor and sit with one's traditional enemy, only to show off one's distrust in such a blatant way. At least there was no Byrand or Garolain among them. With the boy in tow, he walked over to the Gilreth table, noting that the cloth draped there carried the constellation of stars known as the Dragon, rather than the gilded figure of one as depicted in Nuria or the Tree of Gilreth. He halted in front of them, enjoying the moment. Rune looked at each man in turn, a challenge in his eyes. He could tell they felt like traitors simply for being here, in the heart of their enemy's kingdom. There was still a struggle in their minds concerning Fingor. He was their king after all, and this was high treason. He inclined his head deliberately at them and turned his back. Once he was seated at his own table with Gareth, he asked the boy, why would they pick the stars for their heraldry? It neither represents Nuria nor Gilreth. It struck him suddenly as strange that Nuria would select a dragon, a symbol. Was that not a device of Malik's strategy? Gareth's answer disconcerted him even more, though we could not tell why. That is the old symbol for Gilreth, the blade of stars, with its tip in the far north. The dragon came only after the cleansing. I guess they are going back to the old, forbidden way of things. This must be their way of declaring it. Several Aaronite men, most dressed in battle gear and ceremonial armor, entered the room. Gareth stiffened. Captain Ralf, whom he had encountered in Grin's keep during Suntide, led the procession. As they filed past between the tables, there was a tangible increase in tension. Whispers passed from one to the other among the Viron. Looks of distrust darted back and forth. Rune silently shook his head. These poor delegates would never reach an accord, not even concerning his testimony. This would be a complete waste of time. Perhaps the only thing to be gained would be a few hours of amusement as they tore one another apart. The Aaronites took their seats in front of the king's throne, each man looking as if he would rather be somewhere else. They had obviously not called this meeting, neither did they approve of it, but the king had summoned them, and for his sake they would endure it. Their frowning stares of displeasure ensured that everyone realized this. A curtain moved behind the throne. Ranald of Arryn entered, a chamberlain on his left hand and Evrain slightly behind. All the men rose to their feet. As if this had been their cue, Several servants entered carrying wine pitchers and cups. They proceeded to place these on the tables in front of the delegates. 
Ranald turned to speak to the Chamberlain. Everain glanced about the room disinterestedly. His eyes fell on the separate table with the two figures from Heron Inrath behind it. He stared in disbelief. A boy stood there, uncertain, intimidated by the solemn gathering. It was Gareth. Swiftly, he made his way round the tables and beckoned to the boy. Gareth came forward as if in a dream. Though he had been assured that Evrain had not drowned, now the proof of it was in front of him. All his fears were laid to rest at last. He ignored the outstretched hand and gripped the man tightly in his arms, burying his face in his surcoat. Evrain smiled and returned the embrace. His chest was tight and he blinked rapidly to keep his vision clear. He had missed his foster son terribly after their separation in the Witch Sea. A trembling whisper escaped him. I thought you had drowned. Gareth pulled away to hold him at arm's length. He wiped the sleeve across his eyes before whispering back. I thought you'd come to harm in the Witch Sea, all on my account. For a while they just stared. Evrain reached out a hand and ruffled the boy's hair. All the eyes had turned in their direction. Even the king had stopped speaking and was looking at them bemusedly. The silence behind them lengthened. Neither noticed. Gareth frowned a little. Did they give you my message? They did. Thank you. Evrain slipped a hand inside his shirt and brought out a metallic disc attached to a thin string. It was the winning medal he had earned that cycle for the race to Aaron Rock. Gareth was delighted. You got them back? I did, thanks to you. This one I wear to remind me of the life of an enemy I spared and who saved mine in turn. He drew the string over his head. He took the boy's hand and placed it in his palm. Keep it. I had another made for my mast. He smiled. We have to take our seats now. Evrain drew the boy into another quick embrace. Gareth's head was turned to the side, facing back to the table. He looked straight into the eyes of the man still standing there. Rune stood as astonished as the rest of the men. This display of joy and affection between an Aaronite and a Viron broke the tension as surely as a signed peace accord. It was a rare and beautiful thing. There were smiles on both sides now, and low conversations started, where formerly men had nothing to say. A touch of sadness strayed into Rune's mind, and he admitted a degree of envy. This Aaronite had gained the complete trust and devotion of someone his lifelong conditioning and the tragic history of antagonism between their peoples compelled him to hate. More than that, it was this particular boy that loved a stranger, an enemy, so openly and without reserve. Athera had robbed him of having such a son. There was an odd moment when Evrain passed his countrymen on his way to his seat. The burly captain, who had previously locked the boy away in a cell in Grin's Keep, and had been persuaded to release him, stepped into his way. Ralph raised a finger. He wore a heavy frown as recognition came to him. His mouth was open, ready to speak. Evrain never gave him the chance. His voice was low and conspiratorial. It turned out that he was no spy after all, but an ally. How fortunate that you decided not to imprison him in Grin's Keep. Wisdom certainly guided you on that day. The large man remained stationary for a moment. His mouth still agape, his pointing finger held aloft. The questioning, half-surprised expression on his face was so comical, Evrain refrained from laughing with difficulty. Instead, he raised his eyebrows and pursed his lips slightly, as if to show his appreciation of their narrow escape. Indeed. Ranald also had a comment to make. He was obviously relieved to see the evidence that the Nurian boy had not come to harm while in Evrain's custody. Our little prince has found an employer. Evrain met his eye. It seems like it. It is good to see we are still on the same side, said the king. And that amiable reuniting has improved our standing here without the need to say one word. Congratulations. You could not have done it better if it had been rehearsed. They exchanged quick smiles as Evrain took his seat. The other men settled also, and only Ranald remained standing. Despite the pleasantry, he was in a serious mood. Much depended on what would transpire here this day. He looked at the Nurian delegation as he spoke. I would extend a welcome to our visitors here today, but all of us will attest to the meaningless quality such a word has between our peoples at present. I am a king and not a diplomat. Some of my captains will tell you that I am not even a diplomatic king. There were smiles. Therefore, 
I may still claim the reputation of being truthful and sincere when I speak. More smiles. With that in mind, I assure you that our endeavors on this day will work towards making that welcome not just a future possibility, but a present reality. Ralph shifted in his seat, but was ignored. Ranald continued. I realize, of course, that these are not peace talks. But allow me to state unequivocally that I do not attach much value to peace treaties. There are forces at work within my realm, indeed, within my family and household, with which I can never be at peace. Boundless ambition, the madness that would dominate all around, the greed that depicts your neighbor as a rival, the envy that would make you strike a blow against him. These are common to all peoples. If Nurians are touched by evil, certainly there are men in Aaron to match them. He waited for the murmurs to die down. Not even Evrain had heard him speak so plainly before. The others were taken by complete surprise. His words testified of supreme confidence. Those of an idealist was power enough to bring his dream to pass. Now, at last, there was an opportunity. I have fought two extended campaigns against Nuria. I hold today that I have not fought against Nurians, but against the tyranny of their king. He and his counselors have urged the destruction of my realm and the subjection of my people to satisfy their craving for dominance. If we are honest today, the struggle between our nations has nothing to do with the causes of its outbreak centuries ago. A war of blood was declared to avenge the death of the king's heir. How much blood has flowed for that single death? There was a gasp of shock from Ralph. Several others protested loudly. Ranald turned to his lords and singled out their champion. Captain Ralph, how many deaths would you say is sufficient to wipe out the debt? Ralph turned red in the face. He was obviously upset, searching for words. At last he stuttered. That is, not the only death. There were others. After, many died in the raids, and... How many, Ralph? Ranald frowned down on the big man. Speak plainly, Captain, so that we may reckon today if we are any closer to paying the debt than we were six hundred cycles ago. Ralph made one more effort. You cannot meddle with our customs. They are older than the present line of kings. The king ignored the challenge. So, I take it then that you cannot tell me. Is there another here who could? Or should I assume we are bound to a task that cannot be completed by any means or might in our possession. When a man sets out to fell a tree, he does so because there is an achievable, measurable result to attain, or he would not set out. When a merchant displays his wares in the marketplace, he has in mind the sale of his goods, so that he may return home with a clink of silver in his pocket. If there was no way to measure whether he had achieved his goal or not, we would call him a fool. Ralph banged the table and rose to his feet. Everain sighed loudly. The explosive temper had won again. The normal pattern of their meetings was about to unfold. Are you claiming that all these cycles of just retribution have been nothing but foolishness? Ranald looked at him with a bemused expression. I am not claiming it, Captain. You have just proven it to us. None of these present could stipulate the goal of this enterprise. If an enterprise has no goal, is it not foolish to persist with it? Should one not look a little further? and see whether one is being manipulated into laboring for another man's gain? Ralph looked confused. Another man's gain? Ranald allowed in no time to recover. Who stands to gain from this endless struggle? While our blood is spilled, and our neighbors drag home their dead farmers and craftsmen, who smiles at the reports of our loss? Silence descended on the room. Ralph realized he was still standing and sat down mumbling. Think carefully. The list is rather short. I have only two names to suggest. Rastjent and the Track Islanders, or Malik Yulian of Turalan. Rune stirred but said nothing. The idea of Rastjent being behind the endless war was preposterous, but he had noticed Ranald's strategic way of leading his lords by the nose. It was too good to interrupt. Moreover, the king's arguments were beginning to sound interesting. When no one else had a name to suggest, Ranald continued. Rastjent's reasons are obvious. The Sea Ravens benefit from the chaotic situation at sea. They can plunder and enslave without the threat of a concerted effort by the mainland kings to challenge them. However, even though he may approve of the continued struggle, I doubt whether he has the means to propagate it, and recent events have cast him as an unlikely candidate. On the other hand, I know there are agents of Lord Malik at work in Arryn, and these are not the normal spies one would expect from an ally of one's enemy. 
Captain Everain ran into one in the mounds, and barely escaped with his life. Furthermore, I have received reports from the Southland that the Gadrid Empire is preparing for war. Old news, you may think. They are always preparing for war, except that they have run out of neighbors to subject, and ten thousand barges have been commissioned from the Giri Federation, which lies on our doorstep. Even in the Isles, our spies have uncovered Malik's rising influence. Since Rasjent's control is slipping, and a certain Lord Zebar readies himself for a takeover. This Lord is Malik's man, through and through. Ranol had everyone's undivided attention now. Signs of ill humor had drained from Ralph's visage. The king paused dramatically. He pointed at Rune. And here we have a witness to the insidious craft of Malik the Undying. Prince Rune, recently returned from a mission in the Dankwood. He will relate to you what he saw there the secret massing of well-trained armies, and the terrible power at the disposal of this ancient. There was an expected hush. Rune slowly rose to his feet. If Ranald could play his part so dramatically, there was certainly room for a little more suspense. At least, he was encouraged by the fact that the King of Arran believed him. Perhaps he was more reputable than he had deemed possible. He strolled into the space between the tables and halted in front of the Aranites. If someone had told me, but I will tell you now, I would have called him a liar to his face, even if that meant that he would probably remove my head from my body in the next instant, to carve out my arrogant tongue. He tapped the hilt of his blade and smiled. It was clear from their expressions that they understood the implications. You know me by reputation only, deserved or undeserved. He swiveled to look at the Viron behind him. And that is why I have to make that clear. I did not travel all this way to swap tall stories with those who have no reason to believe me. The reputation of the speaker, deserved or undeserved, was apparently enough to earn their trust. There were no objections. The delegates listened with growing astonishment, but none interrupted his account in any way. The men from Gilreth regarded him with narrow eyes and leaned forward on their chairs when he mentioned the beast. The Aronites glanced at their king as if to reassure themselves that they were the object of some trickery, but Ranald wore a no-nonsense frown that clearly showed he was in earnest. The erstwhile pirate in front of them supplied such details regarding the encounter with the monster that fearful looks soon darted from one to the other. Shortly, there was an opportunity for questions. At first, the gathering seemed too shocked to think of anything except for Rune to confirm the truth of what he had told them. He gave them a little time to absorb the facts. Now, questions worth answering and pondering over were posed. Estimations of its size, weight, and relative velocity had to be given. Once more, the issue of fire-breathing came up, as well as possible methods for trapping and destroying such a beast. Rune kept them spellbound, if a little incredulous, till the Chamberlain appeared to announce the midday meal. If he had invented a detail or two along the way, it had been unintentional and harmless, since the embellishment of truth sometimes have to serve to establish it. King Ranald had the Viron exile to sit with him at table. Rune was defensive, expecting to be questioned on his work for Karth, and not knowing how much he was allowed to divulge. Ranald asked him extensively about his stay in the Isles, however, and ended their conversation with a warning for the master of Heron Inrath. Tell Lord Karth that he should not depend on any aid from Rastjent. I doubt whether the pirate lord still commands more than half the track captains. Close to them, Evrain found an opportunity to speak with his former charge. Gareth was happy to ask innumerable questions of the poor Aaronite, who had to dig deep in his memory for the details the boy required. At last, the news was exhausted, and the list of names to receive greetings memorized. They sat in comfortable silence, staring at each other till it was time to go. Once more, Rune would not linger within the walls of the fortress. There was no reason to stay, now that his testimony had been given, and though by this time the causeway was under water, a boat was prepared to take them back to the town. Gareth did not mind returning, since at last he had seen Everin again. He sat smiling all the way back to the inn. The ship from Heron Inrath had not remained in port. A boat would come for them in the early morning hours to take them off under cover of darkness. They decided to go to bed early enough to get sufficient sleep. Brune lingered a little over supper, savoring the local ale. 
Aaron could be a pleasant place, he decided, and judging by their king, the Aaronites were not as ignorant and dull as he had always believed. A large bearded man came over to sit at the table behind him. The fellow moved his chair back so far that it touched runes. Before the Viron could turn to him in annoyance, he spoke quickly under his breath. Don't move away. A few words. I am Lord Karth's man here. There are strange faces about. Be on your guard tonight. Rune murmured his thanks into his tankard. He emptied it and signaled to Gareth. They rose silently and made their way among the tables to the dark adjoining passage leading to their lodgings. Rune looked about him with care, but since he did not know the locals, it was impossible to spot someone who seemed out of place. The door and window shutters of their room could be bolted from the inside. When they had entered, Rune secured both. Then he took a spare girdle from his pack and knotted it through the shutter rings. Next, he tipped one of their beds on its side and shoved it lengthways in front of the door. He removed the pallet from it and dropped it on the floor. The blade was unsheathed and placed within easy reach. Finally, he dropped down on the pallet and proceeded to remove his boots. Gareth watched all these preparations with growing concern. A vivid memory of a room in Rasfarren came to mind. The choking fingers of an assassin round his throat. Are you expecting trouble? Rune glanced up at him. I didn't, but that bearded fellow is Karth's agent, and he did. I told you about prudence, didn't I? Well, this is it. Gareth would have liked to point out that it would have been more prudent to stay the night on Aaron Rock, out of reach of would-be assailants. Instead, he fingered the dagger in his belt and hoped fervently that he would not be forced to use it in such desperate circumstances as before. Rune saw his reluctance. If there is any fighting, just stay out of the way. Hide behind the bed or something. This is my department. He stretched out on the pallet and smiled. I tell tall tales to foreign lords around the Inland Sea and then have to fend off the envious admirers. The boy smiled despite himself. He wished he could be as unconcerned as Rune was, but apprehension had already made him a prisoner. He flopped down on the bed, unbuckled his boots and slipped him off, all the while trying to block the image of the bald, pale figure they had encountered in the mounds from his mind. Rost was Malik's agent, and the malice of his master had made him into an able and dangerous adversary. He had been present when the assassins had heard Lur and almost killed Evrain. Somehow, Gareth felt the hatred of this horrible man still searching for him. Rune made light of the whole situation. Perhaps he sensed the boy's anxiety, for he proceeded to paint the lurking evildoers in lurid tones while they undressed, and by the time he snuffed out the lamp, Gareth had to wipe away the tears of laughter. He did not have much trouble falling asleep. They came in through the window this time. The shutters were unhinged in a single maneuver and without too much noise, sending a blast of cold wind into the room. Rune rolled off the pallet, the blade already extended in his hand. The figure of a crouching man blocked out the stars. He was run through before he could leap down from the sill. Gareth woke with a shock. He struggled to free his arms from the heavy bedclothes. The dagger gleamed next to his pillow, tantalizingly out of reach. There were footsteps outside the door. An axe blade splintered the wood round the bolt. A scuffle had broken out outside the window. A mortally wounded man moaned softly and fell. The door slammed into the bed in front of it. A command rang out, urgent. Rune darted to the door as it was shoved open. There was a flurry of blows and a gasp of pain. A voice whispered urgently in the dark. Another one, round the back. Gareth had freed himself at last. He stepped into the darkness next to the window, feeling a little sick. The dagger was heavy in his hand. A figure appeared and whispered, Prince Rune, the guards are coming. I have the window. It was the large bearded man, Karth's agent. Two men tried to break through the doorway at once. They were at a disadvantage in the dark and fell back before the quick Viron blade, one dragging his leg and the other staggering away with his hands clutched to a gaping wound in his chest. The string of a crossbow sang outside in the dark. A bolt grazed Rune's cheek and lodged itself heavily in the wall above Gareth's head. There was heavy breathing. The men paused to take stock. A tense quiet descended. There was no sign of more attackers. The big man was still at the window. He leaned inside. Rune addressed him without taking his eyes from the doorway. Who are they? One or two sailors from the town. 
but the others had the stink of the mounds about them. You weren't here long enough for them to get more men together. A faint click was heard from the passage outside their door. It was the unmistakable latching of a crossbow bolt. Ruin was halfway out the door, shouting, Stay inside! Gareth stayed where he was. He shivered and told himself it was the cold of the rhyme song night, creeping up his bare legs. The black hose of Garth's household hung over a chair by his bedside. He pulled them on and looked about for his boots. He had a feeling there would be no more opportunity for sleep tonight. Where had they gotten to? He pulled the nightshirt over his head and reached for his shirt. Someone stood in the doorway. The boy froze. Rune stepped into the room, tossing the crossbow onto the pallet. He had a severe expression on his face. His voice was troubled. We have to talk. And this time, I will have the whole truth. Now it would come, Gareth thought. The dreaded moment had arrived. An unavoidable tide to wash away his castles of sand. Gareth stood dead still, hugging himself, the shirt forgotten. He was sick of it, sick of the undeserved hate, the walls of feeling he could not break down. Slowly the lamp flared into life. A muscle twitched over the line of blood in Rune's cheek. His eyes were pools of ice. These men weren't after me. They don't even know who I am. There was no reply. Gareth watched him with large, apprehensive eyes. The bolt that had struck the wall inches from his face cast a leaping shadow as the streaming night air made the lamp flicker. Who are you really, boy? Why would they bother hunting you so far from their home? Why would they risk almost certain discovery to put a knife in you? Gareth closed his eyes and sighed deeply. There was no escape. He had been born in this cage, and there was no way out for him, like there had been none for Riot. He spoke the words as a sentence passed, an inevitable punishment to fall on him once more. He looked at Rune pleadingly, begging for understanding the other could not possibly possess. I am the younger prince of Nuria. I say it to my shame. Rune went pale. He wanted to say something. His mouth opened to do it, but instead he turned away, his lower lip quivering. One hand had gone to his throat. Gareth misunderstood. Desperation took hold of him. It was so terribly unfair. He stood staring, twisting the cord of his pack round a finger. He felt like screaming and never stopping. I can't help it. None of it. I did not want this. Anguish choked off his feeble words. Why must you look like that? Oh, why? He gave up abruptly and sat down on the edge of the low bed, lowering his face into his hands. The man, suddenly seeming so tall in the lamplight, had walked from the room. You sent me out with that boy, knowingly. Rune's voice betrayed the intensity of his emotions. He had rushed into Karth's quarters without bothering to knock. The ship had hardly reached the quayside in Angen before he had stormed off to confront the old man. Karth looked at him impassively. He had expected this confrontation sooner or later. In a way, he was relieved that it had come so soon. He is young, I admit. Do not play games with me. His age has nothing to do with it. That is Fengor's son. That is Athira's son. And the one soul in Myral who has an equal motive with yours to hate the King of Nuria. Karth's eyes stared into the younger man's with a surprising intensity. You cannot hold his parentage against him. No more than I can hold your legacy against you. Rune set his jaw, his breathing heavy. You are still toying with me. I know you are upset about it. I did not tell you for a very simple reason. I needed the boy in Aaron, you saw that for yourself, and you would not have taken him if you had known. Blame me if you like, but I do not regret it. And this time, there was no danger to your person. What? I left four corpses in an Aaronite inn because of that child? Garth risked a smile. You assured me that you could handle assassins. Rune looked at him sarcastically, his anger fading a little. I can, but he can't. You care about his safety then? I care about my safety. That is why I can't play witness to helpless children. He is not as helpless as you suppose. That boy is extremely talented. Yes, 
in the vile magic you value so much. Not in things that matter. Karth held up a hand. I will not argue with you, but do not make the mistake of judging too soon. This boy differs as much from Thingor in nature as is possible. Ask him what happened in the hills outside Belruth, what really took place there, and then pass your judgment. The pale, fog-rimmed sun did little to disperse the early cold. Gareth was not in the dining hall to break his fast with the rest of the garrison. Rune felt a little pang of guilt. He had not been able to speak to the boy since they had left Aaron three days before. Certainly the child was absent to avoid meeting him. Hanik looked at him strangely, in a way he did not like. How easy it was for men to form their opinion without knowing all the facts. A little voice reminded him that he was doing the same thing. It made his questions a little abrupt. Hanik answered them initially in monosyllables. Yes, he had seen the boy. No, he did not know where he was. But he might have gone inland, in a southwesterly direction. Rune shrugged at the detailed answer from a man who supposedly did not know, and turned away. He grabbed a napkin, dropped some fruit and bread in it, and stalked out. The guard at the gate confirmed Hanik's guess. Rune sighed and set off in the direction of the gorge. He should have guessed straight away. While walking, he reluctantly pictured for himself the difficult situation the boy was in. He was obviously embarrassed about Fengor and here was his uncle, to whom the swine had done so much harm. He would expect to be blamed for the actions of the king. Another thought occurred to him. Unlike Lucane, Gareth had not tried to defend Fingor's claims. There had been no spitting accusations, no instant enmity displayed. Suddenly he missed the easy smile they had shared before the dreadful truth had interposed itself between them. The boy rose to his feet. He looked startled, like a bird trapped on the ground at the sight of an enemy. Nervously, he said, I'm sorry, I will leave. Rune motioned for him to sit down again. No, no, don't leave. I was looking for you. Gareth hesitated, uncertain as to what would follow, trying to gauge the other's mood. Rune motioned again. Take a seat. We have to talk. He held out the bundle. Here, I have brought you something to eat. Gareth looked at the proffered napkin, but remained standing. He made no move to open it. Rune sighed in exasperation. <sighs> I'm not going to drown you in the spring. I just want to ask you a question or two. The boy sat down next to the stream. He placed the food at his feet, clasped his hands between his knees, and proceeded to stare at them. Rune could not bring himself to mention the hills just yet. He would have to find a roundabout way to get there. You have exactly twelve cycles, Gareth answered immediately neither sullenly or with any apparent interest. Almost thirteen. I age in the darkening. Three seasons from now. You lived in Belrith all your life? Yes. What made you leave it? They killed my mother. Rune leaned forward with such sudden force that Gareth involuntarily brought up an arm to shield himself. Ow! The startled boy lowered his arm. His voice gained some feeling. Talon forced her to take poison, or be exposed and tortured as a witch. And Fengor allowed this. He would no longer protect her. He did not love her. But you loved her. I don't know. She only spoke to me once, and she gave me a note, and yes, I loved her. He looked up. The blue of Athera's gaze fixed itself on the man. Ruin forgot what he wanted to ask. What was he doing? He had sworn to forget her. You knew my mother. The question startled him. I did, but I have no reason to discuss her. I know nothing about you. The boy turned away again. That can hardly be true. Are my crimes not preached in the temples? Would the king pass up an opportunity to set himself at advantage? Rune half enjoyed the bitterness, testing the reaction of this child against the slighting of his father. Did he still carry the pride he surely had to have carried with him as Fengor's son? The boy looked up at him with an odd expression. In a land full of liars, who can learn the truth? Rune spoke softly as one would do a frightened animal. Tell me the truth about you, and about the murder in the hills of Belruth. Gareth surprised himself this time. He managed to keep the hot tears from spilling over, and the suffocating revulsion seemed to have faded a little. In place of it had grown an emptiness, a dull hopelessness, magnified since that moment in the inn in Arryn. He was worn out by other people's hate. He had no weapon against it. 
He barely mentioned Kenneth in the past, knowing that Rune would take exception to such a distinct display of the art. The journey through Aaron he also reduced to a shorter version than he had given Karth, though he felt compelled to explain why Evrain meant so much to him. When he had completed the tale, he was sad in a different way than before. Here was someone who he wanted to know every little thing about him, but still there were aspects he had to hide. Rune had opened the bundle as soon as Gareth commenced his account. By the end of it he sat in silence, with a half-eaten loaf forgotten in his hand. Fengor had ascended to the level of a maniac in his estimation. He had stolen Athira to desert her. He had delivered his own child to be sacrificed in ritual murder. And when the boy had escaped, he was willing to hunt him to the ends of Myrol. This man could not be sane. He was a disease, a leprous horror to be cauterized. It was Fengor's doing in the end. Gareth smiled ruefully. His and Malik's both want me dead. He suddenly remembered. I wanted to thank you for that. They would have killed me if it wasn't for you. He looked away a little shyly. You are fantastic with the blade. I wish I had one of my own. The boy brought up his knees and lowered his chin onto them, staring at Rune with such a peculiar expression that the latter had to laugh. <laughs> it's something. I did not drag that lot out here for nothing. Gareth went back to the training yard that afternoon to watch Bior struggle with a new set of recruits. Soon he grew bored with just watching and picked up a bow and several arrows to practice. He had completed a few rounds when he noticed Rune leaning against the wall watching him. A sparring session with Jumiel had warmed him and he stood coatless in the afternoon sun. He approached as soon as Gareth had loosed the last arrow. You can use a bow. Bior showed me. He gestured in the direction of Rune's blade. May I touch it? Rune looked down at the pleading face in mild surprise. You have handled a blade before? A little. The man unsheathed the weapon and extended it to the boy hilt first. A slight smile played round his mouth. Gareth removed the leather glove he had donned for archery and held the seer up at an angle, the worn grip in one hand, the sleek blade of glass in the other. Sunlight entered the crystal passage, bouncing from one polished surface to the other till it pulsed with golden fire. He closed his fingers round the soft leather, dropped his left hand to his side, and lifted the tip of the blade. At once the bright sunlight flared, and a growing gloom of fear spread over him. There were cries of pain and death, faded with time and distance, in staggering numbers, the smell of dark hate pervading all, a bitter, insatiable thirst for vengeance. Shutting out these expected phantoms, Gareth reached for the bright line of power, willed the fire over a shadowed horizon, and felt the blade move in his hand. Rune's eyes widened as his blade expanded to its full length. He folded his arms and kept the wonderment out of his voice. You are young to compose a seer blade. The boy glanced at him in an odd way. Perhaps not. The blade contracted silently. Rune held out his hand for it. Here, let me show you how it is done. He sheathed the blade and stepped away from the wall. As he drew it, Gareth could not tell when composition commenced or ceased, for the length of chrysolite seemed to grow from the sheath in one quick motion, as if it were a sword of steel. An impish grin contorted Rune's features as he held the weapon at arm's length, contracting and expanding the blade inches at a time. For several moments, they shared that easy smile again. Rune was the first to speak. There is no time in a fight to look for it. When you need it, a seer becomes an extension of your arm and obeys your every thought. He sheathed it once more in a lightning motion. Though he was impressed with such a display of control, Gareth wore a little frown of disappointment. I will never be able to do that with your blade. Rune looked at him, half surprised. Not? For me, it is full of memories I have to strip away. Memories? Yes, of what you have used it for. There was the disgusted look again, as if he had said something repulsive. Why could he not keep his big mouth shut? You will have a blade that has not spilled blood. Rune snorted in disgust. No, but all the same, 
It should not be tainted with innocent blood. Another mistake. Innocent? Huh. The man's face had gained a little color. Nobody is innocent. Not one. The best of men are selfish, and serve only the purpose that holds advantage. Even the loyal ones, the dogs. Let me tell you something. In the Isles, my pilot, Frika, was the sort of man that one would consider good. Good at heart, good to his family, a good worker, honest to his master, never shirking duty. Yet, he had killed his first man when he was twelve. Shoved a long dagger into his back to avenge the murder of his elder brother. A shudder passed through the boy at the memory of the possible death he had caused on that fearful night in Rasfarin. Rune saw it as a reaction to the terrible deed perpetrated by Frika when he had still been so young. He continued, Now, no one would deny he was a good man. His act could have been justified, but he was not innocent anymore. The blood I spilled with this blade was tainted. Pigs, not men I killed. Gareth tried to change direction. He was loyal to you. What? What did you say? What would you know of him? Only what I can hear when you speak of him. He raised his hands and said emphatically, I am not looking around in your thoughts. Rune ignored him. Yes, he was faithful to me, but dogs are also faithful. People are more than dogs. Gareth said a little reproachfully. Rune grinned. True. They turn on you much more often and for far less reason. Gareth smiled in return, then grew serious again. You are right. They were not innocent. It's not the men you killed with it. It is you. What you struck them down for. The blade remembers your anger and your hate, and much of pain. He stopped. Rune was staring at him in an odd way. You feel that in the blade? The boy nodded slowly, uncertainly. He knew what the other thought of the art. Behind him the sun was sinking into a bank of clouds, turning the western sky to a deep red. For once, Rune did not display his disgust. A frown creased his brow as he straightened up to stare over the yard. His hand moved to the hilt of his blade and lingered there. That evening, a rain squall struck the island without warning. Heavy clouds suddenly blocked out the stars, and a gusting breeze ripped through the fortress, banging doors and driving the torrents of water through open windows. Men ran about cursing, securing shutters and picking up overturned furniture as they went. Guards were summoned to check on the lamps for fear that a spool somewhere would start a fire. Sleet came down here long, creating such a din, a crashing on the slate roofs and against the wooden shutters that it was impossible to communicate without shouting. Gareth huddled in front of the fire in Karth's chamber. Tonight there would be no lesson, for the master was occupied elsewhere. It was time to complete the story of Finwith and his epic struggle. Viran was burning. The survivors pushed into the outskirts of the northern forests. There was no Aaron to come to their aid, no Ligerium as yet, no masters in the towers, no king in Belruth. These were the evil times when Myrol was young and the mighty Veer, a lonely wanderer consumed by bitterness. Kale was but a lowly lord on the fever coast, unaware and blind to what was transpiring about him. The blow had been struck against them, the small kingdom in what was to become Gilbreth, while their king was far away in the hand. The queen was taken from her bed and dragged away but not killed. It was her thoughts that reached the journeying hero and made him turn for home with all haste. The warriors were slain their bodies untended in the blazing fields. Forever after, the Viron would prefer the send-off to a bed in the cold ground. Fell beasts devoured all that could be overtaken in the mad flight, and the men and enslaved hordes of the threefold alliance against the north pitched their battle tents in the heart of their enemy's terrain. The young king fought his way through gales and pirate traps, through the grasp of traitorous friends and hardship, but at last he landed to the south of the Dark Weed with his band of twenty, all armed with a new blade and armor of chrysolite he had gone to contend for with the Vadron of Argoth's hand. A desperate rush upriver, slipping through the enemy lines at the crossing, up ever northward through the night, pausing for two hours of sleep and the last of their supplies. How they cut down the hordes, till their blades were grimy and sleek with dark blood, and they could hardly remain upright for fatigue. And then, the great moment, 
Fenwith stood alone, his people at his back, his warriors bleeding and worn out. Across the field of battle rose a great winged beast, a foul creature of the abyss, his breath a river of flame, his fangs and claws long as swords. It was then the great warrior dropped to his knees, beseeching the soldier god for strength enough to smite the horror, even if it took his life. Gareth rolled onto his back and stretched out his arms. The firelight danced on the ceiling above. His eyes were filled still, with the blue leaping light on the great king's armor, the set of his jaw, the resolve in his eyes, and above all the blade of a champion, alive and of impossible size, a two-handed swing, engulfed by the red flames of the creature, a desperate lunge, the scraping of claws on chrysolite, and now the falling, falling of the enemy's perversion destroyed. The rays of a liberated sun on the unmoving form of the warrior king and the panicked forms of enemy survivors racing away. That was the blade for a true champion. That was the blade Rune would need. Thank you.